Hello everyone, welcome back to the podcast. If you are an OG listener, you've been following along my health journey from chronic illness sufferer to healed practitioner, then you'll probably know how problematic food intolerances and food sensitivities were in my health journey. It was probably one of the worst symptoms that I had was the fact that I just wanted to eat healthy foods. I wasn't even trying to eat junk food and McDonald's and takeaways. I wasn't like, I, I didn't want that anymore. I definitely had that in the past, but I, I just wanted to eat a nice meal and be able to go to a restaurant and enjoy my food. But because of many imbalances inside, which I'm going to cover six of them today and how I healed from them and how I reversed ultimately the majority of my food sensitivities. But if you are brand new, then yeah, just know that this was a huge problem for me and it was really depressing actually because I was such a foodie, still am, but to be able to not be able to enjoy food anymore and I've had times on holiday, I didn't really go on holiday that much when I, like abroad when I was really sick, but we'd still go on a family holiday every year to Cornwall, St Ives if you're familiar in the UK. And I would actually take so much food with me. We'd have like a separate suitcase with all of my supplements and snack bars. And um, I actually took a George Foreman grill with me. We were staying in bed and breakfast and kind of knew the owners. It was this older couple um, who we'd been going to for years before. So they were happy with me to, well, at first, happy for me to go into the kitchen between his use of cooking breakfast. And then I'd make my own lunch and dinners. A lot of the time um so i spent like hours on my actual holiday just in the kitchen and my friend my family were out to eat they were really supportive and they didn't make me feel bad they were just like do what you have to do um but yeah they'd be at the restaurants they'd be on the beach shopping and i'd just be inside cooking my own meals and i think the owner got pretty annoyed after a few days because i'm like i'm not done yet i'm roasting my squash cooking my chicken breasts and um, I didn't actually like the pans that he had. So I went to the Tesco nearby and bought some pans as well. And then just left them there for him to use. So things got a little bit crazy for a while, but I was just so desperate to eat. I really got into like food fears. And I had some degree of orthorexia for a little while in the early stages. Because I, I was like just clean eating and trying to like count my calories and all of that. But that didn't last too long. It then honestly just became, I know it seems very disordered, but it just became me desperate to heal pretty much. And I'd do anything to do that. And I went to some extreme uh, places for that. But looking back, I don't think I needed to. Um, there was a time and place for me to have this more limited diet because um, for one, I couldn't tolerate things. And I just had so many digestive issues. It was hard for me to actually absorb my food. But like me just not going out to eat was actually a, a bit, stupid looking back because I'm sure I could have found like a chicken and vegetable option and that's all I was eating really um when I was cooking for myself but I was aware of like the oils they were using and rapeseed oil and I would be so inflamed so I didn't want to add more inflammation to my body with all of that stuff but in this podcast episode I want to show how bad things actually got in that stage of life and it's a little bit difficult to remember everything because I think I have some sort of PTSD trauma response. My my brain just forgets a lot of it to be fair, unless I'm like um, provoked and I can go back. But I choose not to because I know the overview of the story, but I don't need to go into like the depressing uh, details because there's no point. So in this episode, I'm going to use the term food sensitivity and food intolerance exchangeably, but. I am talking about food. I am talking about that, not allergies in today's episode. There's a difference. So an, aller an allergy is an IgE mediated response. And most people know when they have an allergy because that's going to that's gonna show in things like anaphylaxis, tongue swelling, um, immediate vomiting, diarrhea, um, rashes. Just think of like peanut allergies, egg allergies, gluten allergies. People usually have them from birth, but not always. My dad actually developed allergies in his 50s because of mold exposure, which we're going to be talking about today. So he actually had a full blown allergy and anaphylaxis to um, peppers, seafood and chilies. And he'd gone his whole life without any food issues at all. So allergies can develop. They can actually be reversed, but 
some of this stuff you don't want to be playing about with, especially if you're un if you're not under the care of a practitioner. I have seen actual allergies reverse. Um, my dad's are so much better than what they were, but this is in this is a little bit different. This is IgG immune response. So these are often something that we acquire, we develop because of imbalances. And because of that, they tend to be short term and reversible. And the reason that this happens is because of a process known as leaky gut. If you've been in the health nutrition world for a while, you might be familiar with this term. But basically, um, a leaky gut response is when the tight junctions or the lining of your gut, so your intestines, your small intestine, the it should be like a brick wall separating the contents of your intestine, so undigested food, bacteria, stool, to your bloodstream. There should be this barrier. It is semi-permeable, so certain things like nutrients can get through, but overall it should be pretty strong and robust. But for a number of reasons, six of which we're covering today, but then there's other things like gluten, um, antibiotic use, they damage the, the mortar, so to speak, in the gut lining, allowing some of that content through into the bloodstream, that creates a huge immune response. It makes the immune system go crazy and it starts seeing these food particles that it shouldn't really be seeing at that stage. They should get broken down. So if you think of a necklace, I'm, I'm wearing a, a little pearly necklace today. Um, think of that as being like the, the food. When we have poor digestion or we're chewing three times and then swallowing and we have leaky gut, these like larger strands are allowed into the bloodstream and that's more likely to develop uh, sensitivity because the body doesn't recognize it when it's like big pieces of chicken. What it does recognize is like a single pearl. So these amino acids from protein, from the chicken, or this particular nutrients from the egg. So um, yeah, it should be in its smallest form when the immune system gets to see it. But with leaky gut, it's the bigger, bigger bites, so to speak. And then the immune system recognizes it as danger, um, foreign, it's not meant to be here, let's attack it and let's create an immune response. So that's a sciencey overview in a bit of layman's terms though, um, as to what's going on. But we wanna see that leaky gut process as a symptom, not the actual be all and end all, because that's a huge mistake that I made is that in that initial stage, I was just trying to heal my gut. I, I knew that I had leaky gut based on my symptoms and all of my learnings, but then there's all of these products and protocols that are, are marketed to heal leaky gut. So take this bone broth, take high doses of L-glutamine every day. I had really, really bad reactions to those two things. I did many more, but bone broth, for example, I didn't know at the time that I had um, histamine issues and mast cell activation syndrome, which I'm going to cover next. Um, and for that reason, the bone broth would make me absolutely crazy. I would have severe migraines and headaches, very itchy, um, loose stools, just really upset. Um, gut, I thought I was having a detox reaction <laughs> from it and I thought I needed to push through, but it was because I hadn't fixed the underlying cause of the leaky gut. I just had this chronic inflammation, so much histamine being produced that that food, if anything, it was worsening my leaky gut. And this is bio-individuality um, thing, again, just highlighting the importance of that. The other one was L-glutamine. And so I was thinking it was like, take um, many teaspoons of L-glutamine all throughout the day, and that's going to reverse your leaky gut. It's been shown in bowel disease to do so, but not knowing with that one that I had glutamate excess, my neurotransmitter was just through the roof, um, partly because of mold exposure, I think, looking back. I didn't know at the time I was exposed to hidden mold in my house. And my glutamate levels, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, was already really high. My brain was already really inflamed from the mycotoxins. So then adding L-glutamine pushed that higher and it was literally killing my brain cells. I had probably the worst food intolerant food sensitivity reaction that I've ever had was in, oh, I can't remember the year, but maybe like 2015. Yeah, 2015, 2016, maybe. Um, I was in Cornwall again and for, for whatever reason, I thought I wanted to eat out that day. Um, and I chose a Thai place because I thought like there's fresh ingredients and vegetables, there's meat dishes, and it's all cooked in house. I can see it and it looks really nice. And the food was good, but I didn't know that they would be adding um, MSG to the food, which is very common practice, even in like the um, most like clean Chinese place, um, Thai restaurant, 
uh, freshly made, it doesn't matter, they all still use um, MSG a lot of the time. And MSG is monosodium glutamate. So another huge exposure to that, and that was really bad. Um, I actually remember going on my Instagram story. So if you've been following since then, you are really like seeing me at the worst point at that time. Um, but it was on the drive home from Cornwall. My mum was driving, thankfully, but I just didn't feel good the next day. I um, I basically ordered um, just basic white rice and this thing called tamari duck. So it was gluten free, all the good things. It was amazing. I just it was just a flavor sensation when I ate it, but it was lighting up my my brain. And this was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I actually was gonna order another plate of it. I was that obsessed, but now I know that L glutamine. Um, and glutamate, MSG, all of that literally lights up your brain and can make you feel good temporarily. But the next day on the drive home, I had um, cyclical symptoms. So every 20 minutes or so, I would uh, pass out. I would vomit and um, blood as well. Um, sorry if TMI, hopefully you're not eating right now. And I was just completely out of it. And it was a seven hour, maybe eight hour um, drive home for my mum. I was just not with it um i was just vomiting every 20 minutes like i said trying to open the door on the motorway because i was just like not knowing what's going on just fainting um serious migraine the next few days and that was probably my worst ever food reaction but other than that on a more day-to-day -day basis when i was eating just my regular healthy trying to eat healthily meals um, after eating, I would get some of my symptoms would be facial flushing or redness. So I would just feel really hot. My face would be really red. I was prone to that anyway, just like social anxiety stuff, but it would just exacerbate. After eating, um, I would get dizzy when I was eating the foods. I would get palpitations sometimes, itching, skin, burping, bloating, acid reflux, um, and often a feeling of anxiety and panic as I was eating. And then that was in the moment. So food intolerances can happen this way where you might react right away or you might react one to even four days later. But for me, one to three days later was when some of these other symptoms would show up. So then my gut would be affected, um, constipation, loose stools, acne breakouts, rosacea. I had a condition called seborrheic dermatitis, which is like fungal dandruff on my scalp and on my face. So between my eyebrows, sides of my nose, um, anxiety, depression. I had bladder issues where I would literally, um, out of nowhere, wet myself. Like I would feel like, oh my God, I need to go now. And then it was just too late. Um, so that was this overactive bladder um, situation. Um, stomach aches, severe itching in the night. So I would wake up at like 2, 3, 4 a.m. and just couldn't get to sleep because I was so itchy. And they were the main ones, but I will definitely be missing some, but I'm not going to go on and on and on. Um, but I even made like really interesting connections. So during those few years, and it was a, a good number of years, I remember thinking, I, I put the puzzle pieces together that I um, ate potatoes, white potatoes, especially the next day, I would always be really anxious, which I was like, what the hell? Like, how and why is that the case when I'm eating such a small amount, I'm having protein that organic. But I didn't know at the time that I had an issue with um, nightshades, nightshade vegetables, and I had a severe fungal yeast overgrowth, mold overgrowth in my body, and that carbohydrate and sugar was actually feeding the infection and making me feel worse. Um, even recently, like the past couple of weeks, so we're in March 2023 when I'm recording this, but I actually had a breakout. You might be able to see the, um, the leftover on my cheek if you're watching the video, but I had breakout because um, last Saturday, so it's, it's taking forever to go and I hardly ever get spots at, um, these days, which is a complete 180 from what it used to be like. But we went to this um, health food cafe. Um, I ordered a blueberry cheesecake. It was made of all like raw ingredients, but a lot of dates and um, coconut sugar and all of that, which I don't eat often. And it was just a huge serving. And I had it on empty stomach. So two days later, I had this big spot on my cheek. And I told my boyfriend, I was like, this is from that raw cheesecake that I had two days ago. And he was like, how do you know that? Like, how have you identified where you've got the spot from? And I was like, it's from years of living with chronic acne, chronic health issues. You really get to know your body. <laughs> so I thought that was a funny little addition to know that I can still really 
pinpoint things and it was all about putting the puzzle pieces together back then I had a little notes app on my phone um, and I didn't keep a food diary every day but I would mainly track my symptoms so I would if I was having a really good day or a really bad day I would write down what I'd done differently had I started a new supplement had I eaten something that I'd not eaten for a while had I added something new in um, and that over time allowed me to see particular triggers that's how I identified first the histamine problems and then it kind of exploded after that and I had a lot of other symptoms but I will be sharing today these root causes for me and what I did to overcome the multiple food sensitivities but I initially thought I just had a histamine problem but because of my health history especially the mold stuff I actually developed mass cell activation syndrome MCAS for short and this is actually way more common than you'd think I think the stats are maybe one in seven or eight people have this to some degree because it can be very mild for some people it can be very obvious for others the classic MCAS person is going to be someone who is highly allergic has multiple chemical sensitivities can't be around fragrances the detergent aisle in the supermarket feels really nauseous and dizzy they might have POTS um, they might have um, it's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome they might have um, Ehlers-Danlos that whole triad often goes together um, they can scratch their arm and they'll have a bright red mark that lingers for hours afterwards that's cl classic MCAS so I never thought that I had it or even looked into it because that was a I wasn't as extreme as that but I was definitely on the spectrum so it's yeah I'd say with my chronic illness clients so I'm attracting a bit more of a complex case these days um, because it's hard for them to get answers anywhere else but I'd say one in two or one in three of my clients have MCAS some to some varying degrees and I have um, a few episodes on histamine mast cell especially with Beth O'Hara so if you search her name on the Hormones in Harmony podcast or on YouTube and Viva Natural Health You'll be able to find that on there because she goes into the science a little bit more so now i am not 100 percent. i totally admit and I've, I've never said oh i'm fully healed like everything's good everything's perfect health is an ongoing journey not a destination that you reach and then stay at um and to go from those terrible symptoms to where i am today um, is amazing but i'm still looking for more i am ongoing supporting my health and I'm open for it to be 100% healed at some point but now I would say I am 90 to 95% healed so I need to still be mindful of histamine intake around ovulation um, so this is when your estrogen is higher and therefore your histamine is higher so my food sensitivities do flare up slightly around that time and I feel okay now with small amounts of gluten whereas before I'd eat a small amount and I'd have joint pain and I'd have diarrhea um, but I choose not to eat it regularly just because I don't think it's a health food I prefer to eat more gluten-free nutritious grains and I have a family history both sides of autoimmunity and we know that that is a big driver of autoimmune problems and leaky gut but now I've eaten it like a few times last year and I was totally fine I had no symptoms but I'm just not gonna eat it on a daily basis anymore and I still don't feel great eating junk food or drinking a lot of alcohol like most people don't it's not actually good for us and it is very inflammatory so that makes sense uh, but so that's not what we're talking about either I'm, I don't want to get to a place where I feel absolutely amazing eating junk food every day because I don't think that that's normal um, but I'm talking pretty much about all of the healthy foods that I previously had issues with aren't a problem anymore I am so much more free and love my food again um, into cooking again whereas before it was just a chore because I did it three times a day minimum for like years and years and years and it was um, a lot of the healthy stuff that I was sensitive to I was down to around 10 foods at my worst point just to show the extent of how things got for me um, I know people have like one or two food sensitivities but for me uh, I don't know if you don't have to look into like all of these food compounds in detail but I had issues with histamine that was probably the main one but also a compound called salicylates so histamine is things like um, leftover food um, fermented food pickles vinegars um, alcohol citrus tomatoes avocado chocolate 
all of those are high in histamine. Salicylates are things like berries, coconut, um, olive oil. So again, healthy stuff that a lot of people advise. They say eat lots of colorful plants and herbs. Whereas if you have histamine, uh, if you have salicylate issues, then those foods are really high in that and you could actually feel worse. Um, nightshades I had an issue with. So this is the white potato, um, bell peppers, chilies, aubergines or eggplants if you're from the US. Um, FODMAPs were another compound I had issues with because I had bacterial overgrowth in my gut. So these, let me see if I can list it out. Um, FODMAP stands for fructo, oligo, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols. And that's my IBS nerdy research coming out there for you. But that is things like apples and onions and garlic. Um, just anything that's anything that can ferment in the gut, which for the healthy gut is really beneficial because it promotes the growth of good bacteria. Whereas when you have dysbiosis and um, SIBO, those foods actually make you really bloated, gassy, can give you brain fog and sometimes break out. And then just some of the common ones, um, gluten, dairy, corn, soy, I had problems with, refined sugar, alcohol. Uh, alcohol was one of the one one of the first ones that I realized I had a problem with because I just had like severe hangovers. I would have breakouts afterwards. I could feel really anxious. So I stopped drinking when I was, I think, 18, 19. Um, and oxalates, I had an issue with to some extent, but not as bad as other people can. Um, for me, they triggered histamine. So oxalates are found in um, spinach and, and green vegetables, also sweet potatoes and almonds. So I found a diary of mine recently, which was very, like, very weird to read. Like, it's funny at one point, and then it's like crying at the next reading through it. Like, it started off as my diary from when I worked in America. I worked at summer camp when I was 19, if you didn't know. And that's where, um, after that trip, a lot of things got worse. So that diary started off me sharing my day-to-day -day what I was up to at the camp. Um, and then it can, kind of continued for a little bit as like a health journal. I remember saying at that point, I was just desperate to eat healthy foods again after the camp. And I realized that I'd become sensitive to soy, dairy, peppers, and oranges, and some other foods. And then I worked with a nutritionist when I was about 20, and she um, recommended going gluten-free for those reasons that I mentioned earlier. So that's when I cut that out. And then for the years after that, up until I was 25, 26 yeah 25 or 26 um i went through gut healing protocols because things just got really bad after that trip um i'd been on the pill for a few years i had food poison on the trip once i got back home from america i was re-exposed to mold in the house so i I'd had the house had had issues with mold i think since chap since i was a child because it's a really old house but I think having a break from it and then coming back slowed things up. And I also um, believe I picked up some tick-borne infections from the US as well, just where I was in the world. Um, so in those years from like age 20, 21 to 26, I really struggled with more food intolerances, um, got down to about 10 foods. My, my safe foods, number one was squash which might sound really weird but the, there's many different varieties of squash and i love that and my body just always tolerated it which i'm so thankful for and i remember every week i would drive half an hour um there and back to a place called unicorn grocery in in charlton just outside of manchester and it's an organic co-op and that's when i started getting into like organic foods as well and they had loads of different options for squash especially in the fall and winter and one week they didn't have any in stock and I was relying on that for so many meals for my breakfast I used to have squash roasted in the oven and then I put some um, maple syrup and almond butter and some hemp seeds on there and that was my breakfast so really low in protein thinking back just a big bowl of carb uh, it's probably spiking my insulin but I was just basically needing the calories because I'd lost a lot of weight because my diet was so restricted. So I actually cried when they were out of stock one week. Um, and I was like, please, can you bring it back in? I thought they'd just discontinued sourcing it forever. Um, but I, I survived. They, it came back in the next week and I was good. So I'd have squash a lot. 
I even traveled to Cornwall with a bag full of squash, which are very heavy and like weighed the car down when we're trying to get up hills. <laughs> and then uh, Swede was another one, sweet potato, courgette, lamb, chicken, duck eggs, interestingly, were fine. I couldn't tolerate chicken eggs, so I learned that duck eggs can often be tolerated even by those with chicken egg allergies. Um, so I, I was fine with them. Ghee and macadamia nuts. It was along those lines. I can't remember the full list because, as I said, I think my brain has locked things out. But a benefit, if we're trying to think of benefits and silver linings from all of this, is that my diversity for food became a lot more. I I was trying to find things that I could tolerate. So I, I looked, instead of having almonds, I looked to macadamia nuts. Or instead of having um, kale, I would have courgettes instead. So it really allowed me to try a wide variety of foods. And with meat as well, I did have um, venison, which is something that I would never have, and chicken liver. But because I was limited and I couldn't tolerate beef or pork a lot, I had to be creative and look to some more foods. So I don't want to <laughs> drag this out too much with my story because I've had episodes on this before, but it's nice to have a bit of a summary before I get into the causes. But these are the six causes. Um, of my food intolerances and I'm going to show a little bit more about how I healed from them but if you want me to do a deep dive on any of them in particular please let me know otherwise this episode is going to be five hours long. The first one was the mold exposure so the way that mold causes or contributes to food intolerances is because of how it um, triggers the immune system most of these that's the that's the case but with this one in particular mycotoxins are poisonous and they are carcinogenic and they can suppress some arms, arms of your immune system and exacerbate others. So they push down the Th1, push up the Th2 arm of the immune system, which just makes you more allergenic, more histamine-y, um, and more sensitive, just in general. It affects every part of the body, so it can really affect the liver, the gut lining. So these lingering points that we're going to come, come on to, mold can actually exacerbate all of this. This is why I started the list with mold exposure, because it was so significant for me can't emphasize that enough if you're really struggling with chronic health issues please investigate this more um so yeah mold is just very damaging very inflammatory to the body triggers the immune system it contributes to leaky gut directly damages the gut lining like antibiotics can like gluten can so for me i had lived in that house it's an old victorian house it was my family home i'd lived there since i was four up until 20 2020. Um, I'm 28 now, born in 1994. So I'd lived there from 1998, just doing the maths. And I think there'd always been an issue because that house was built in the 1890s, which is crazy. But then over the years, um, there was a known incident where a pipe had burst under the floor. I remember it. And I just don't think it was dealt with properly. My dad just bailed out the water, tried to dry it out, but I don't think that was enough. And then over the years, things just got worse. Um, and then the more imbalances I acquired from going on the pill, from being stressed, from eating junk food, because I'd had like an iron stomach up until my food intolerance started. I never had an issue with foods. I ate everything and anything and was totally fine. But your body can only take so much for so long. And my diet really had started to slip in my high school years because I'd use my like pocket money to go to the shop and buy sweets have like Chinese takeaways with my friends and we just, I just wasn't healthy. So then all of that um, filled up my toxic bucket and then mold just became a huge problem. And I think, like I said, when I went to America in 2017, I had had nine weeks then to kind of detox from the mold. So I was just outside pretty much all the time in the woods um, and then in New York for a little bit afterwards. And then when I came back, bam, it was like, the mold is here. It's like just been summer, it's really humid. And I had had other issues develop from that time abroad too. So how I healed is basically like for me, I, I moved, I was already moving anyway into my current flat. And that is where my healing actually started. So even though I'd been on my health journey since I was 20, 20 probably, I didn't actually start healing until I was 26 and I moved. And I, 
other alternative would be to remediate the home and my parents have since done some work on that I don't think they've fully done it as much as I would like but they are feeling an improvement at least but there's still an issue with humidity um, moisture windows kind of window sealants bursting and all of that it's just an old house and hard to upkeep but yeah apart from moving like that was the biggest thing my body just actually started to kick in and heal itself at that point but I've also done so many other things um like binders and glutathione and work on my liver and coffee enemas and saunas they're probably the biggest things so that was number one mold exposure was a huge thing for me and it's something for you to consider as well especially if you're just becoming more and more intolerant to other foods second one is parasites parasite infections they affect allergies and intolerances for the same reason they disrupt the immune system they can damage the gut lining there is actually a very common crossover between histamine and parasites and also dairy problems dairy allergies or lactose intolerance with parasites too um, and i've definitely seen that to be true for myself and they just promote leaky gut promote chronic inflammation they also put you into that th2 dominance so you're just more histamine allergenic and my story with parasites is i tested for them so i did a stool test when i was 20 so when i came back from america because I, I had food poisoning about three times when i was over there really bad i think on the camp um it was from the water because just throughout the day we'd, we'd have to fill up our water bottles with like a well um and the water was literally brown when you had a clear water bottle it wasn't great and then after the trip i went to new york and just on the hot food counters even that it wasn't whole foods but it was somewhere similar i got food poisoning after that um, and then another time as well in that summer so i think my parasites came from there but when i tested at age 20 i had two parasites come back on a stool test um gi map it was and it was the um parasite blastocystis hominis and the amoeba fragilis which are two common ones and they showed up really high on the tests and then i did some herbal stuff i actually did an antibiotic or maybe two for those parasites and I did a test, it come down, but not completely. So they were pretty stubborn. And then I finally managed to clear them with that combination of herbs and conventional antibiotics. And then since then, my stool test had always come back negative. But when I started parasite cleansing again, because I wasn't convinced that they'd gone after learning a little bit more these past couple of years, I started parasite cleansing again. Now that my body was stronger and now that I'd actually addressed the mold, because until that was done, my immune system just was not working properly. So I, in 2020 and 2021, did a lot, about six months total, um, and then a few months here and there since, um, so parasite cleansing. And even though my stool tests were not clear and normal, I literally passed worms out of my stool several times and yeah it was just crazy experience and this is why i'm such a big fan of parasite cleansing now and i've done many episodes on that too um so that's how i healed from parasites i don't think i have zero parasites in my body because they're a completely normal part of life but my parasite load was extremely high and i really think that that it, it does play in with the mold as well it, it's a two-way street so until you address the mold you can't really address the parasites and then until the parasite has got are gone, you can't really clear the mold toxins. Um, so doing both simultaneously is often good. But if I had to pick one, it would be the mold and the air quality. Number three kind of ties in is that I recovered and addressed my chronic infections. So because of my mold exposure, uh, my immune system was down and it allowed other bacteria and viruses to take over my body. And because I was directly breathing in, mold from the environment i was breathing in yeast and fungus i ended up with a severe candida yeast overgrowth internally um, and this affects it in the same way leaky gut chronic inflammation th2 dominance so on and so forth um and my story with that is that early on when i started getting a lot of digestive issues after camp and those food poisoning events I um, learned about SIBO and leaky gut and I just thought right I just need to heal my SIBO I even said this in that diary entry it's like I've just found out I have SIBO I've just done a test just found out I have parasites I'm going to be fine after I deal with that little did I know it was years and years later um so with SIBO that small intestine bacterial overgrowth and those bacteria and these 
pathogens can promote histamine as well. So not only can we get histamine from food, our body can make it on its own. So it just put me into this like very inflammatory state. Plus when they eat things like sugar, they create waste products like ammonia and urea, and um, they can really cause a lot of brain fog. That was another symptom that I had a lot of issues with. Um, but they, when they feed, they reproduce and they produce gases and very toxic gases that overwhelm the liver, um, really slow down the gut and just make us overall more toxic. So healing that, I've done a number of things. I've done so many gut protocols, but not all of them have been successful. For years, when I was doing a gut protocol, I never took a binder. And I can't believe no practitioner has ever told me the importance of that. No wonder I felt like I was going to die on some of those protocols because it's so important when these bugs release all of their waste products, you have to bind to them. Otherwise, they're going to get reabsorbed most of the time. And I was doing all of these enemas. No one had ever told me to take binders. So that's why I had some relief because I was getting some of that stuff out. But overall, I, I would feel really bad. And it would just be a really slow process because I wasn't adding binders in. So I've done herbal formulas. I've done conventional antibiotics. I even paid £250 one year to get the uh, Rifaximin, I think it's called antibiotic for SIBO that was all like the rage at the time but even those camps they were never looking deeper no one ever mentioned mold as a factor or deeper infections like parasites because the body is smart if you have a, a large parasite infection in the large intestine then the bacteria are probably going to migrate to the small intestine to get away from it and to make sure that they have a chance of getting some foods too so always keep looking deeper and deeper and that's why I try not to really specialize in one area anymore is because I know the body is interconnected and I don't want to just blame everything on parasites or mold or candida because most people have a combination of all of them we often have many imbalances so we need to have a bird's eye view and look at everything and look at the whole person holistically number four um, problem that I had to work on to heal was nutrient deficiencies and mineral imbalances. These are important for actually processing your foods properly. So, you know, when I was saying with leaky gut, the food needs to be fully broken down so that the body recognizes it in its like very small particle state. You actually need nutrients like sodium and zinc to make stomach acid so that you can break down your proteins, your iron for absorption. You also need minerals like um, potassium to process certain nutrients. You need minerals like selenium and amino acids from protein to fuel your liver detox to get some of those compounds like histamine and mycotoxins out of the body. I always knew that I had issues with my liver. I knew that every time I'd support my liver, I felt some relief. I felt better. Things like coffee enemas, things like milk thistle. Um, I knew that it helped, but then I had to again, look back and think, why do I have to keep supporting my liver and spending so much money every month on liver, liver support? Why is it just not functioning like it should be? And then that's what made me think I must be being exposed to some sort of toxin on a daily basis. And I found the nutrients like glycine. I heard that that was good for that glutamate um, over production that I had. Glycine's the opposite. So I knew I probably had a deficiency of that. So I started taking it. Um, and that really helps the salicylate intolerance because that nutrient is involved in the um, glycination pathway in the liver, um, which helps to process salicylates. So our liver is really big. It, it's really huge. It has a lot of roles and it really requires a ton of nutrients every day. So because I'd been on such a restricted diet, initially for dieting reasons, but then because of health reasons, um, because I wasn't absorbing things. So I had low stomach acid and just weak energy, um, really like major overgrowth in the, they were probably stealing the nutrients. It was just becoming a vicious cycle. So I needed nutrients to make digestive enzymes and fuel my liver, but then I needed healthy liver function and nutrients to, to digest my food. So it just kept going round and around. So this is where really good quality supplements came in. So glycine helped um, another nutrient that I'd never really heard about, but ended up really helping me was molybdenum, which is a trace mineral. It's involved in processing sulfur, helping with the sulfation pathway of the liver. 
um, chronic infections, love nutrients like that. And then more recently, since I've gotten into her mineral testing, I realized that I had a major calcium deficiency because I was dairy free for 10 years from age 17, 18 to only in the past 12 to 18 months. And that was because I was reactive to it. I was choosing the wrong forms of dairy. Um, it would give me bloating and breakouts on my face. But since 2020, when I moved and especially addressed mold and parasites, I can now tolerate dairy fine. I, I choose to eat raw dairy because it does better. It works better for me. Full fat, organic, raw milk. I have it every single day and it actually helps my skin and my gut. And I do better with um, raw cheeses, um, sheep's and goat's cheese. So things like feta, goat's cheese work a lot better for me. Always organic. And calcium is really important for stabilizing mast cells as are nutrients like um, magnesium and vitamin C. So because I was severely calcium deficient from a combination of poor absorption again, but also poor diet, not actually thinking about calcium, I was so focused on other nutrients like zinc and magnesium that for years I didn't even think about calcium. I just thought, oh, I can get that from leafy green vegetables, but I wasn't eating anywhere near enough. And they really can't compare to really good quality dairy products if you can tolerate them. So I feel like a healthy body can often tolerate dairy, um, but there is obviously the genetic component. Some people just don't do well on it or they do better with different forms of dairy, fermented dairy, but I couldn't tolerate that at the time because of the histamine stuff. So everyone is different, but this is where minerals um, really became a big passion of mine. I started doing the mineral testing and I had a course called I'm Balance, which I opened early 2023 and it'll be open again later in the year. Um, but the calcium deficiency that I had was quite severe. And even though bone health is effect affected by a number of things, it did make me concerned and make me worry for those people who are plant-based, vegan, they just cut these foods out of their diet and they're just not thinking at all of the nutrients that they're lacking because I, I have time now to make up for it and recover and know exactly what to do. Whereas those, those people sadly are just not thinking things through and they're just doing this very uh, like trendy diet at the moment with veganism, plant-based diets, and they could be running into some issues later on in life, unfortunately. So um, when I when I started adding dairy back in, the non-fermented types, it actually helped to calm my histamine production, my mast cells and my food intolerances, which sounds crazy because dairy technically for a lot of people is one of the most common sensitivities and allergies. But for me, raw milk healing is a really healing um, food. Next one kind of ties in um, heavy metals because they do cross over with mineral imbalances quite a lot and they can affect food intolerances by being literally poisons in the system. They can deplete minerals and they can directly cause things like leaky gut. They can affect the thyroid and the metabolism and the breakdown of food so many different ways. I never had a major issue with heavy metals like some people do. Some people it's just a huge um, mercury or arsenic exposure that's contributing to health issues and with the mineral testing that I do I did identify along the way that I had um, some arsenic issues some mild mercury which could have been passed down from my parents even since birth because they had metal fillings in their teeth and that's not something that people think about I thought just because I don't have any then I should be fine but they can be passed down um, generationally but in May 2021 oh 2022 so last year I even did a podcast episode on how this holiday changed my life, but everything kind of happened around the same time. So I went to Madeira in May 2022. And on that trip, I felt like a new person during and after. I felt like it was a rebirth because I just felt so good. And it probably was the sun and the food and um, being in the sea, all of that. But two days before I actually went away, I had my metal braces out which I have had braces twice. I had them twice in my life when I was about 14 at high school. And then because I didn't wear my retainers, my teeth moved again over the years. Um, so I had braces on at the end of 2019 for about two and a half years. So I had them removed. And within days, I, I noticed I'm so much less reactive. And I don't think it's any coincidence because of what metals are in there, things like aluminium, arsenic. It's, it's basically an amalgam of different 
metals, another one is nickel, which I've always like looked into and I always thought I had an issue with that. Reaction to, to cheaper jewellery, I've noticed that before. But um, recently, from that experience, I've been looking more into oral health. So I just have my plastic retainers now and they're not perfect, but I'd rather that than a fixed metal brace. But this year, I'm actually looking into more of the impact of oral health and breathing techniques and your airways. Um, I've had people on the podcast before talking about this. Dr. Gelb, Dr. Michael Gelb, years ago now, he came on and shared his wisdom with us. But I'm actually investigating this more and I will share more about this as I learn. But I really think I have a um, narrow dental arch, narrow jaw um, because I've had teeth removed. I, my teeth keep moving back if I don't wear my braces. So I'm going to learn more and I'll share with you my knowledge when, when I can. Very last one, things that I've done to heal my multiple food sensitivities. Number six is rewiring my brain and calming my limbic system. So this plays into it because when your body has been under stress, real or perceived, um, physical, emotional and chemical, it can be mold exposure is a big one, when you've had a chronic infection, when you've had an injury, parts of your brain can go into cell danger response. So they kind of go into hibernation and they don't fully heal properly. I'll, I will do more episodes on this if you'd like, because it, it's a little bit more complex than this, but basically... It's like with mold, if you even move out of your place, but you haven't fixed the brain thinking that you're still in danger, then you will probably still be reactive. So I have over the years um, done a few things. I started off with the, in the mold world, the traditional recommendations, which is called DNRS, Dynamic, Dynamic Neural Retraining System. It's a very common course um, on this subject by someone called Annie Hopper. I downloaded it, I did it for a few days, a few weeks, but I was actually already healing at that point. So I just thought, I don't need to do this, I'm good, like everything's fine. Um, I'm already feeling better just, just moving and doing my detox work. So I actually stopped doing that. And then since I've signed up to something called Primal Trust, which is more of a membership site, um, that I am recommending more to clients these days because it's just more holistic. And this person had done some of those other things as well. She'd been through dnrs she'd been through chronic illness and kind of formulated her own training so if you want to learn more about that then parental trust would be my go-to but i've since done things like um, emotional freedom technique and um, gratitude i'm really into personal development work and uh, be mindful of language not real not focusing on symptoms because i realized that the more that i did that the more that i would just attract negative things into my life if I was just waking up thinking I still have this problem I still have this problem I had to really focus on what was going right in my life and the ways that I was healing which can be difficult to do when you've got health issues because your brain anyway is just automatically wired to think of the negative but even more so when you have neurotransmitter imbalances poor gut health your your brain is just really in this negative cloud a lot of the time so you have to really make this a priority and force yourself every day to surround your brain and your mind with more positive stories of healing and recovery um, and not going down the negative rabbit hole of Facebook groups and um, reading people's horror stories, how they've not been able to heal and how they're literally like bed bound and struggling. So brain rewiring was a big one. I've also done some um, trauma release work and therapy along the way. And I even realized I have like a lot of control issues because of the health stuff that I went through because I thought no one else is helping me. I'm, I'm going to the best doctors out there. I'm paying privately to go to these specialists, but no one's actually giving me any guidance and help. They're just trying to throw medications at me or new diagnosis. So I had to do it all myself. So I just became really um, controlling with that and just thought like, I'm, I'm going to, figure everything out but that spilled over a little bit into other areas of my life which I'm trying to still work on so be in more feminine energy slowing down which can be difficult when you have a business as well because that is a very masculine thing to to be the um kind of center of the business and, and working on everything wearing all of these different hats but now that I've, I've had my business for a few years I've been able to set up structures and a lot of things are just very automated now 
and I'm used to them, but those first few years of setting up a business and having chronic illness was a little bit challenging, as you can imagine. So just to recap the top six things that I did to heal from my multiple food sensitivities. First one was address the mold exposure. Number two, address the parasite infections. Number three, other chronic infections that I had. Um, number four, it was address the nutrient deficiencies and mineral imbalances. Number five was to reduce the heavy metals, especially with the braces. And number six was to rewire my brain and calm my limbic system down. If I, I tend to find that a lot of people are struggling with one or more of these if they have food intolerances and sensitivities. So if you can relate to maybe some of the symptoms or you know that you're struggling with a list of more and more foods that you can't eat, then investigate these things further. I have a few resources with if you have issues with mold or suspect or you want to learn more, I have my mold recovery course, which you can sign up to at any point. I'll put all of these links in my um, episode show notes. And then for the minerals and metals thing, I have my mineral course, which opened early 2023, but then it's going to open again July or August. So you can get on the wait list on that on my website. If you want to see if you have a calcium deficiency or heavy metals, high arsenic, some of these other things that can be contributing. And I do have more offers coming soon. But in the meantime, if you want to investigate this further, rule in or rule out all of these possible reasons, then it would be my one-to-one -one root cause relief package that's the top recommendation. So with that, I go through your entire health history, even your family history, to see how you've ended up in the position of food intolerances or whatever you're dealing with. And I have the information, like I've just said in my show notes, but just know that healing is possible, but it does take time. When I started to really heal, which was June 2020 after moving, I noticed that in one to two years that my improvements were about 70 to 80% better. And then June this year, June 2023, it'll be three years. And I'd say I'm going to be like 90 to 95% recovered at that point, but still finding ways to improve further. And I want to get to that 100%. But I'm also happy based on where I've come from if I just stay at this place. But I'm always optimistic and for example over the the last year i've just been finishing up some lyme homeopathy treatment uh, because i hadn't really addressed that aspect of the puzzle piece until recently i knew that things like mold would be a deeper driver of lyme disease so i hadn't done any more work on that and i've, I've tested positive multiple times for borrelia which is the the bacteria associated with lyme disease um, but it's not affecting me that much at the moment, but I still wanted to do some work in case it was having a lingering stress on my body. So please let me know if you enjoy solo episodes like this, where I've been sharing more about how I've been able to recover from years of chronic illness to where I am today. I just want you to take something from this. And if it helps just one person, I will be happy. Um, and yeah, just I want to make a difference and help you recover faster than I ended up doing. So share this with anyone who you think will benefit from this information. And I'd love for you to take a screenshot of you listening and tag me on Instagram so I can see who's, who's following along and enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll be back in your ears next week for another episode. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I would love for you to leave me a rating and review on your podcast app as this helps to support the show and it allows it to reach more people with this valuable information. Come and say hi over on Instagram. I'm at Viva Natural Health. And if you haven't already, check out my website, vivanaturalhealth.co.uk for tons more free resources and to discover how I could support you further. I currently offer one-on-one -on -one consultation packages if you want my top level support, then more affordable group programs and self-paced online courses. So there really is something for everyone. If you're ready to change and get some answers but aren't sure which option would be best, take that first step today and apply for a free enrollment call on my website and we'll discuss the best steps for you to take in order to achieve hormonal harmony. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you back here next week for another episode.